Up to a year ago, whenever the words no-till would be spoken, I just flipped a switch and turned off and said, they're not talking to me. I don't have anything to learn. I'm not gonna pay any attention. Because I thought no-till had nothing to do with an organic vegetable farm. Then this side project happened, which was the no-till experiment on an organic vegetable farm. This project was a brainchild of NRCS, hand in hand with Virginia Co-op Extension, and then my local Loudoun Soil and Water agent, and that was the killer team that helped get this ball rolling. One of the foundational principles of the way the farm works now is that every other year, a field gets to take a vacation. And taking vacation means not growing a cash crop, growing soil building crops. So a series of three cover crops, a winter, a summer, and a winter, before it goes back into making vegetables. So historically, and normally, at each one of those changes from one cover crop to the next, there would be the act of mowing and then spading, tillage, and then reseeding the next one there was an opportunity during that vacation year to try to remove some of the tillage passes. And I said, sure, because all I know is that no-till vegetable production itself has not been interesting to me from an economic standpoint. But this isn't about growing no-till vegetables, this is about growing no-till vacation year crops. Now that sounds interesting, because I know, we all know, that the negative impacts of tillage are pretty serious, formidable, and I have to pay attention. I'm always doing penance to repay my debt for the tillages that I have to do in order to grow carrots and peas and beans. And if there was a way that during this vacation year, I could gain even more ground by leaving that soil undisturbed for 12 months or maybe even 18 months in a row, I know that would make then the cash crop successive to that grow well. So that was the premise. In organic systems, we don't have herbicides on the shelf that we can use. And so tillage is the final decider of who lives and dies. And so for a winter cover crop, which in my case is barley and crimson clover, to die, I have to till it up and kill it, or I just let it dry and fall down, drop seeds on the ground. And so that's what we did. And then the barley actually regrows. Because it's vacation, it's not a problem, because I'm not trying to grow carrots. I'm just going to try to grow some more cover crop. So we no-tilled into this and it worked great. There was quite a success of using the no-till drill in the fall into a very luscious and successful summer cover. So here we took standing six-foot Sudan grass with four-foot cowpeas in it let the frost come and sort of knock them back somewhat. And we just drove that machine right straight through the field to plant then the winter barley and crimson clover. So I didn't have to flail mow, I didn't have to spade, I just got to plant straight away. The biggest benefit was time and energy savings. There's plenty of work to be done on a farm, and when you can figure out how to accomplish a goal in half as many steps, that's a huge jump in efficiency. One of the first questions that came up was, what rate should we plant the cover crop seed at? There's no means of weed control. This is no-till, there's no cultivation, and there's no herbicide. And that means that we want the crop that we want to have growing, the cover crop, needs to jump out of the ground 
and cover the soil and suppress the germination of weeds. We wanted to err on the side of heavy. Because we're in a less than perfect set of conditions, and so we actually tried doing at a fairly, what we call a good rate that the machine was set at. We did one pass, then we did another part of the field, two passes, so double seed rate, and then we did another part of the field with triple the seed rate. I would say I want to go double. Double what would be the normal rate in a bare field tilled situation. Renting any piece of equipment has, has its own set of issues, which is what's, what kind of condition is the machinery in and is it going to do the job and how worn out is it? And we had issues with all of that. Uh, and eventually I th we had a situation this spring where the, the planter was worn out enough that it couldn't actually get through the thick rye residue that we had in a couple fields this spring. And that was pretty disappointing. Whatever it is you're gonna no-till into needs to be not just a bunch of weeds. It needs to be a lot of residue of a crop that isn't noxious. And so we saw with some experiments this spring where we were no-tilling a summer cover into barley and crimson in a field that had a really beautiful winter cover crop, now has a really beautiful summer cover crop with very, very few weeds. Conversely, in the field next door, same soil, same timing, it didn't have a very good winter cover for us to then plant into this spring. And so it's got some weeds in it. We knew theoretically that these are, these are things that we know about in no-till, but now I know them myself with my own eyes right here on the farm. Now that I've spent some time with the drill and seen how it can fit into my farming. Now when I see the words no-till on an article or in a conversation or at a conference, now I'm a little bit curious. I would like to have a no-till drill. So I'm starting to shop. I think it fits quite nicely into my soil health improvement goals. I never would have thought that was gonna happen.